there is one. Hello? Okay, this is working. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Elrich Museum. It's so wonderful to see you, to have people here again, to be doing events. Um, I'm Ksenia Gerstein. I'm the Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Ulrich. I'm joined tonight by my colleagues, Leslie Brothers, who is the director of the Ulrich Museum, uh, Jenna Irwin, who is running around back there, making sure everything is in perfect working order, and who masterminded the Voices from the Vault series this year. Um, Carolyn Koppel, our um, events and membership manager, who I think is still downstairs welcoming people, and Ranjit Arab, our creative communications manager. Hopefully I didn't forget anyone. Um, Voices from the Vault is a series of talks that we inaugurated in 2019 to create opportunities for our audiences to learn more about the works in the collection, even when those works were not necessarily on view as part of an exhibition project. The idea was to highlight some of the treasures uh, that we hold in our vault in the run-up to the museum's 50th anniversary, which is very quickly coming up on us in 2024. Our plan was to focus each academic year on one decade of contemporary art making that's well represented in the collection, starting with the 1970s, which is when we were founded. So we began with the 70s and then very quickly got derailed by the pandemic. So we kind of had to skip over the 80s. But we, are, but we did have five wonderful events in the series so far. And if you're interested, if you missed them, or if you're interested in looking into the history of the Ulrich and kind of our thinking about um, our roots, uh, you're, I would encourage you to look at the YouTube channel, which has an archive going back many years of wonderful Ulrich programs. And there you'll find the, the discussions of work by Lee Adler and Vitaly Komar and John Bader, as well as talks by um, curator Catherine Morris, among others. Um, so this year, we are focusing on the 90s, and we are delighted to welcome Nancy Davidson as our first speaker in that series. Um, once you see Nancy's 1997 piece, Buttress, downstairs, which hopefully all of you did see, you know, you're never going to unsee that. Uh, <laughs> and tonight, we will learn about the larger artistic practice that allowed us to add this asset to our collection. Um, Nancy Davidson is an interdisciplinary artist working primarily in sculpture and installation. She grew up in Chicago and received a BFA from the University of Illinois at Chicago and an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Since 1979, she has been based in New York and since 1992, much of her work has used inflated weather balloons to challenge the notions of contemporary monumental sculpture while repurposing comedic tropes of bodily mass, fleshiness, and beauty. Her solo exhibitions have taken place at the Cranard Art Museum, that's what you're seeing here, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, at the Boca Museum in Boca Raton, Florida, the Miller Gallery at Carnegie Mellon University, Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, and the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Philadelphia, among other places. Her honors have included grants and awards from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Paula Krasner Foundation, Creative Capital, Anonymous Was a Woman, and the Yaddo Residency. Finally, but very importantly, I'd like to acknowledge that the Voices from the Vault series would not be possible without the generous funding given to the Ulrich by Humanities Kansas, a nonprofit cultural organization that connects communities with history, traditions, and ideas to strengthen civic life. We're deeply grateful to Humanities Kansas for its support of our efforts and for everything it does more broadly to bring high quality humanities programming to communities throughout Kansas. If you don't know what they do, check out their website. They do really good work. Um, a quick note that our next Voices from the Vault uh, talk has been rescheduled to November 30th. So please mark that on, that, on your calendars that we'll be bringing um, the wonderful artist Edgar Heap of Birds and uh, tell your friends about this as well. And so now, finally, without further ado, Nancy Davidson. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone involved with inviting me, and a special call out to Ksenia 
Gerstein and uh, for the introduction, and Jana Irwin for inviting me to speak about my work and uh, about Buttress uh, that's in your collection and part of the series, Voices from the Vault. I'll begin in the middle of my work with Buttress. Well, as someone said to me today, you know, photographs just don't do it that much good. <laughs> so 15 feet tall, five feet wide, three feet deep, yes. The title refers to stone or brick support for a wall. And my buttress definitely supports the wall. It, uh, yes, my, definitely, my buttress definitely supports the wall. It's made from large air-filled balloons attached to the wall by a rope and a clip. The garments on each one of the five pieces are exactly the same. They're based on a principle of rotation. The fabric pants visually rotate from the top to the bottom. The stacking of buttress comments on Brancusi's endless column and Judd's stack with a gender difference. All use the form of the stele. The second from the bottom inflatable is displaying an essential part, the nozzle. Yes. <laughs> this piece demonstrates several of my long-standing concerns. Commitment to abstraction, my attraction to exaggeration and the comic, inserting the body into the dialogue of abstract forms, and the fragility of materials. The first version of Bencuzzi's Endless Column is an indoor sculpture about seven feet tall, 1918, in the MoMA collection. The most famous Endless Column is in, in 1935 is 89, 98 feet tall, anchors the Endless Column Park, which celebrates the survival of Romania, the artist's homeland, after World War I. Stiles have been used to commemorate people and events. When Judd created his first stack in 1965, an arrangement of identical iron units stretching from floor to ceiling, the work represented a breakthrough in his integration of art and architecture. Many versions of this form were created by Judd throughout his life. The next several sculptures of mine use the stele form. This piece, Dulcinea, is named after Don Quixote's muse from Cervantes' Man of La Mancha, 1999. Quixote did not have a real lady, so he invented one, creating Dulcinea to be the model of female perfection and beauty. I created a 16-foot tall Dulcinea, more than a fantasy, seductive, gargantuan, composed of large, abstract, generative forms. Sky High, a fountain proposal for Kansas City, 2005, in this night view, is a 28-foot glowing column programmed with LED lights to give the illusion of a waterfall. Here's a daytime virtual image, precast fiberglass. I began using digital media to communicate with institutions and fabricators. I returned to the stele form, stacked, in 2016. What does this commemorate? Unruly forms, pop stars, eroticism, it's eight, feet by three feet by two feet. Humor is a way for me to engage and confront my audience, while acknowledging it is impossible to predict reactions. Excess is an integral part of American popular culture. The desire for the overly large looms in everything from hamburgers to houses. But I want to go back briefly to my early influences to discuss the return of the body in abstract sculpture. 
Eva Hess's work influenced me in many ways. It's sensuality, fleshiness of materials, use of repetition, gravity, fragility. She moved beyond minimalism's reductive constraints with a reinvestment in the human body. She spoke about absurdity and repetition. Studio, 1966. Eva Hess holding her work and working. I'm not the only one that blows up balloons in the studio. In 1992, I refocused my work towards sculpture. I wanted to work, I wanted work that occupies three-dimensional space and have scale and physical impact of sculpture, yet be light in weight so I could manage it physically. I was always attracted to humor, but I didn't express it in my work. One day, I had a thought about weather balloons. I wondered how it would be if I worked with a balloon as a form for all the reasons I just stated. I sent for one, and the minute it arrived, I blew it up and knew immediately it was the perfect material. Funny, grotesque, oversized, erotic, absurd, attractive, and a body of flesh, a body of bulbous parts, male, female, we all have these bulbous parts. Air as a medium is always in flux, and latex, like all of our bodies, is temporal. This is Blue Moon, a hybrid body for Elvis. A formal note about suspending sculpture, the emphasis, oh, where are my notes here? Um, the emphasis is on, oh, let me see, yes. Um, the emphasis is on mobility and on the ability for it to change, not about holding still. So when you suspend sculpture, you allow it to move and do things that you don't do when sculptures are more tied down. I'm gonna share with you a few passions that inspired me when I started using inflatables. I'm a lifelong lover of carnivals and puppets. I've always been a fan of Macy's Parade. When I was researching the early parades, I was amazed at the themes of grotesque and frightening characters. Pinocchio in 1935, with a 44-foot-long nose. <laughs> I was studying Mikhail Bakhtin's theories about the grotesque body, a comic figure that celebrates life and death, and reading Jeanette Winterson's book, Sexing the Cherry, about a gigantic woman who had enormous appetites food, sex, dogs, and more. And this is the original cover from Sexing the Cherry in 1998. Excess in American popular culture is not new. 1936, Mae West costumes were absurdly ornamental and as she stated, trimmed with excitement. Her costumes foregrounded female stereotypes to the point of parody, the female impersonator. Many of her costumes were designed by Edith Head. My Maybe in the center is a stand-in for Mae West. Is she caught in the net or floating away? A passive audience doesn't exist at the carnival. The viewers of sculpture are similar to viewers at the carnival. The energy between the sculpture and the viewer is essential. Maybe has a double corset with a waistline way over 200 inches. May West represented inflated luxury, scale, excess. I'm completely aware of my complicity. Carnival eyes. These pieces represent the place of the viewer voyeur at the carnival. How important is the voyeur? Is this surveillance? Mm -hmm. 
They look back to the space between the audience and the sculpture. Folly is one of our deepest necessities. Nutella, golden eggs, upside down girl, or circus spider woman act. I love the absurd, unruly, and transgressive. Spin two, part clown, part spider, sister of the rap group Salt and Peppa. The sculpture is attached to the ceiling with elastic cords and to the bowling balls on the floor at the bottom, the inflatable, um, using the weights to pull backward, allowing the large central inflatable to lunge forward in space. Volume, weight, and pressure are finely balanced in this piece. This photograph and the next are based on my photographs of Spin 2. They're more subversive than my sculpture, playing with mimesis. This is Bon Femerie, named after an Angela Carter character. It's seven feet long. Fevers, named after my favorite character in Nights at the Circus by Angela Carter. Neither big ugly nor small nice, a petulant child. Seven feet tall, just touches the floor. Ruby Juby, giant pop bead bracelet made from bowling balls weighing over 400 pounds. Crystal Blue Persuasion comes with its own soundtrack and lighting requirements. Dudette, comedy connects people. The audience responds individually. Humor is inherently unstable. A closer look, and it's a banana bicycle seat. Not a fella, celebrating the construction of gender, Hitchcock's famous profile with a Greek hairdo. In 2003, I was commissioned by the Corcoran Gallery to create a sculpture for the biennial. During my first site visit, I was curious about the Beaux-Arts atrium space. It had a glass floor, a second floor balcony, and a 40-foot high skylight. The materials were hard and cold in color, and the forms are all vertical. It was also the site for Ronald Bladen's X piece in the Form and Content exhibition in 1967. I chose the atrium site for my piece, Double Exposure. It became a container, drawing the audience into the space, focusing on awareness of the play between the architecture and the form. The scale invited the audience to view the sculpture in parts or as a whole. The bottom of the piece is approximately 12 feet from the ground, so it's 20 high, 20 wide, and 36 feet long. Suspended by a rope and glowing from the inside, double exposure became a physical experience. From underneath, the audience could feel the gentle swaying above their heads. From below, it's impossible to tell whether the form is suspended or actually floating. The walls under the colonnade are painted a deep pink. The red curves of the form rise above the railing of the mezzanine, looming like small hills within the museum's Beaux-Arts interior. Musicians arrange to play their concerts under the piece. My focus on the cowgirl began after 9-11. From my studio, I watched the World Trade Center towers falling witnessing up close the devastation of my neighborhood. Intuitively, 
I began thinking about my past and personal mythology. As a child growing up in the 50s, the cowgirl character and her can-do spirit inspired me. I remember my fascination with rhinestone cowgirls, Hollywood films, and musicals. And my memories, coupled with 9-11, set off an investigation into the history and the legend of the cowgirl. Gail Davis played Annie Oakley in the TV series here, 1954 to 56. Popular culture sent mixed messages. As a teenager, I found these images exciting and empowering. Gloria De Haven, a can-do kind of gal, wearing a cowgirl costume, 1954. Creative Capital, at this point, funded my project. And it expanded. But who were the real cowgirls? Early media dime novels had their own stereotypes. Girl, sport, pard is one. 1895. I was at Fort Worth in, 19, in 2008 doing research at the National Cowgirl Hall of Fame and, muse and Museum. A women's professional rodeo event was taking place in the ring next to the museum. Never having attended a rodeo, I didn't know what to expect, so I went. I captured on video the last bucking bronco ride of rodeo champion Jan Uren's 47-year career. of that woman. <laughs> oh boy. I couldn't believe someone who was 62 years old would be riding in such a physically hair-raising way. Rodeo became an obsession for me. I had to find out who these cowgirls were and what was their history. Rodeo cowgirls did things that were unacceptable. She was an American icon. All the ideas about popular tropes and stereotypes I had previously worked with were embedded in the rodeo cowgirl. 
Pendleton's famous rodeo performers, are they represented in folk tales and legends? But I wanted to use humor and scale with an eye to contemporary popular culture for my cowgirl tribute. The Uniroyal Gal, Roadside Colossus, embodies the American cultural tradition of tall tales. When she was first made, she was modeled after Jacqueline Kennedy. Somewhere along the road, she lost her clothes. I also wanted to include the female erotic body. Here, the entrance to Dreamland, Coney Island, 1908. I added some body parts for comedy. I fabricated three cowgirl inflatables. This is a preparatory drawing for one of them. A 28-foot proposal for cities, parks, festivals, and carnivals here in Times Square. I'm still hopeful. I wanted to bring the three cowgirls together in a dust-up, inspired by the classic cartoon Fight Cloud from the 50s. The word dust-up was first used in 1897, an American word from the West. Here, lashing the girls together to put the comic dust ball form put them together in the comic dust ball form. Time-lapse video of dust up installed at Betty Cunningham Gallery uh, with ambient rodeo sound track. This is a, uh, a detail of the leather streamers and sawdust, and another detail of them lashed together. I began to understand rodeo as a ritual reenactment. The circular nature of the rodeo arena began to interest me as a site of ritual. For fun, I invited a friend to attend a Gotham Girl roller derby. The entire event reminded me of the rodeo. I videotaped the team over several years, a record, a recording their ritualized actions. This still is from my video, I Am Not Tame. In 2016, my work took a darker turn. 
We are living in liminal times and a moment of political culture and cultural change. Ideas involving ritual discussed by Victor Turner continue to captivate me. For my exhibition, Per Sway, in Miami, 2017-18, I examine liminal characters in a ritual setting. I envy a gigantic, one-eyed being, both ancient and cartoon, sits high above a on a platform overseeing all activity, 11 feet tall, giant bulbous eye looking down, trying to dominate a parody of power and control. The environment is cued to the luminous effect of twilight, the color of liminal time between day and night. Jason Rodriguez, you might know him from Pose, uh, performed in the space. This gives you an idea of the scale. Sinsteris, or way after Lala Kwan, uh, on a platform, serving up a self-satisfied snake, complete with two rattlers. Detail of one of the rattlers. Mini Sin, a miniature version of Sinsteris, but much tamer, here caught on a tanning bed. In 2017, I was invited by Amy Powell, the curator at the Cranert Museum, to visit and propose an installation. As I walked around the museum at night, this was my first view of the Kincaid Pavilion, in addition to the museum. It immediately reminded me of ancient sites, invoking the power of architecture and memory. My first response to this site. I was reminded of the Porch of the Maidens, a favorite museum of mine in my childhood in, the in Chicago, the Museum of Science and Industry. I imagine the maidens coming to the Kincaid portico, returning it to a classical period with a twist. I wanted my sculptures to be hybrids, wandering between goddess and maiden, the multi-breasted fertile goddess Artemis of Ephesus, combined with the sign of virgin maiden, long hair falling loose down the braid down the back. This version in Naples Archaeological Museum has skin and hair in cast painted bronze, and her body is carved in cream-colored alabaster. The dark color, some suggest, may represent dark wood of archaic statues. Artemis of Ephesus has dual powers. She's goddess of the hunt, wild animals, and sacred mother. Some sources call the multiple forms on her statue bull's testicles. I'm fascinated by the magical hair of the caryatids that hold up the pillars of the ancient porch in Athens. Giving my sculpture the loose maiden braid would make their hybrid character fully visible. A closer look. I started planning my hybrid maiden goddess to occupy the pavilion with a sister, not exactly a twin, in shades of red, a full 18 feet tall. The sculptures incorporated a braid emerging from the top of each piece and continuing to the pavilion floor, suggesting caryatids, a feature of ancient Greek, Roman, and neoclassical architecture. The giant loose braid coming out of the top of the multi-breasted beehive form descends to the floor with a contraposto twist. Yes, this twist. I'm aware of many references in Louise Bourgeois' work to Artemis of Ephesus, but I had a different idea. The sculptures referencing Artemis of Ephesus' multi-breasted form cross over from classical to grotesque. They're modeled after the two center pillars of the Porch of the Maidens, their knees in mirror image reversal, and reflected the structure of the portico. 
Using digital rendering, I was able to share my vision with the curators. I wanted to create a sense of the original porch so we could imagine how it felt. Color washing lighting was used to light up the inside and outside of the pavilion. Think of the Acropolis at twilight with subtle light changes over time. Hive in, con in two forms, in concert, in conversation through sound, light, and color signaling. Morse code, extraterrestrial communication. I was inspired by the light display in strange encounters of a third kind. Our project was joined by Clara Bosak Schroeder, a classical professor, classics professor at University of Illinois. She became one of the curators, and also by Lakshmi Rampogal, an ancient history professor at Columbia and a multidisciplinary artist. You can't really hear the voices on the outside, but I placed them in the video so you could get an idea of what you would hear in the portico. Uh, and basically, they're vocalizations based on breath, possibly referencing ritual laments by priestesses. The experience of working collaboratively on the sound and light aspects of Hive reminded me of how important it is to embrace surprise and challenge. Hive functioned as a public art project it was on view 24-7 with light program that set up communication between the two sculptures, flashing and passing color between them. COVID put a halt to the area I wanted to explore, the multi-sensory experience of being in the space. A local photographer, Della Perone, and I were developing a community-based collaborative project. When the piece was, is reinstalled in a couple of years, we hope to move forward with our ideas. This is a brief look at some of the unseen planning that goes into making sure sculptures work in the space. I was explaining to um, several curators today, you see that box right there in the middle? That is actually a sculpture by Laredo Taft. Uh, and it's called the blind, and it's in the middle of the space, as you can see. And when I saw it there, um, I just decided that it should be just left as it was and not put in a box and just exist in the same space with Hive and that they would work together. And I think, although you can't see it very well, sometimes when you look at the photographs, of, of Hive, you can see that um, you can see that sculpture actually in the space. This um, is a shot about how one installs sculptures of this scale uh, with a cherry picker and plenty of help. And here it is before the blower gets turned on. The internal workings of the quote unquote wireless system for the light program. The Raspberry Pi is the, cent is the command center, and you see it in the center of this image. And this is a shot inside the inflatable, just showing how baffles are used to maintain the shape. And you can see the LED light going down the upper right side. And this is a not quite finished uh, installation shot with uh, 
for scale, and I'm standing there on a on a little bench-like area thing that goes all the way around the um, pavilion. Hive at night. Our team hoped to provide a platform for discussions and a bridge to conversations among programs at the University of Illinois, including classics, gender and women's studies, LGBTQ studies, architecture, art history, ethnomusicology. But because of COVID, we were unable to follow up with our plans. However, when Hive is reinstalled in several years, hopefully we can continue our community and university events at that time. I'd like to share a few of my favorite works with you. They're all temporary, gigantic sculptures. Starting with Hun, a cathedral by Nikki de Saint Fal in collaboration with Jean Tingley in 1966. Visitors entering through the opening between her legs could walk, go to a milk bar and a movie theater inside. It's a great piece. Huh? Working drawing plan, also used as a poster. And this is showing it inside the modern museum in Stockholm, Sweden, where it was constructed. Another favorite of mine, A Subtlety, or The Marvelous Sugar Baby, by Carol Walker, 2014. A white sculpture depicting a woman with African features in the shape of a sphinx. The piece was installed inside the Domino Sugar Refinery in Brooklyn and pays homage to all the unpaid and overworked artisans who worked the fields, the cane fields, and the kitchens. After the exhibition, the building was destroyed. Side view of the female sphinx with narrow shoulders, foreshortened body, the Sugar Baby was the largest single piece of public art ever erected in New York City. Both monumental and political, 35 feet tall and 75 feet long, a white colossus dusted in sugar. A back view with a heart-shaped buttocks and enlarged feet and toes. 15 black boy figurines carrying agricultural bounty surrounded the Sphinx. These sugar babies covered in molasses stand about five feet tall and weighed about 400 pounds. As the show progressed, the babies melted down, leaving puddles on the floor. I recently saw images of Amal a Syrian girl refugee puppet who is walking 5,000 miles over nine months in support of refugees. Amal is nine, a very specific age with her naivete intact. The story of her journey as a lost child is important to her many creators and sponsors. On Chios Island in Greece, a Greek island, the immigrant community welcomes Amal. I couldn't leave out Louise in her 1976 suit. <laughs> and back to where we began. Thank you all for coming. Does anyone have any questions? I know it was kind of long, so I'm... Any questions? Yes, yes, in the back, yes. Uh -huh. Uh-huh. 
Uh, you know, it's really interesting. No piece of mine, some, some, they're not all made out of um, inflatables that uh, are latex. You know, some of them are fabricated. Some of the pieces are, you know, they're, they're made out of other things. But um, n I have never, ever had anyone um, pinprick one of my pieces. Never. I mean, it's a long time to exhibit without having any of that. Um, they have been touched. They have been kissed, even. You know, like they, uh, you know, there's lots of fingerprints at the end of any show. You know, there's fingerprints because what happens is that the, in, is that the latex starts getting dusty. And so more and more, the, when oil touches the surface, you know, it shows up. So, you know, as time progresses, about three months, they, la they last about three months. So, um, yes, they, they begin to show their um, age. But no, no one has ever, you know, put a pin to them. Yes. Sure. Sure. Um, you know, I, I've been doing this since the mid '90s, so um, um, sometimes um, young feminists used to ask me about uh, my uh, referencing bodies and, you know, so, you know, large female bodies. And um, my feeling is that. Um, I really uh, celebrate bodies, and I celebrate scale, and I'm also um, aware of, uh, you know, that, it, that there is a critique of it as well, you know, because of the overly large, you know, how we, you know, sort of constantly want something that's so large and so overdone. So, I, you know, as I said, I'm completely complicitous within that, you know, within that framework. So, yes, if, if they, um, and, and they have, you know, they're involved with humor, and humor is uh, something that you cannot control. And if people, you know, don't like the humor or don't, you know, then I think that's exactly how they should feel, you know, if they, if they feel offended. They, you know, then they should examine why. And I, I you know, talk to people about that. Yeah. I hope so, yes. I do hope so, yes. I hope it brings people back to a kind of childhood pleasure. Um, I remember when my granddaughter, she was a year old and she'd never seen a balloon or never had one. And at her birthday party, she was given this big balloon and she was just like, you know, just like, oh my God, I, I don't know what to do. I'm so happy. I'm so delighted, you know. And, in, you know, in a way, I think, you know, working with inflatables and how they swell and how they you know, are so extreme in their possibilities. Um, I think that's a, that's a, that, that is like a childish pleasure. You know, it's a, it's a pleasure of childhood. And for everyone, you know, to remember, you know, and also, you know, I, I, I like that idea. And yes, they're hypersexual, so they're also very adult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Can Yes. It was not uninstalled. Yes. Um, the piece was up from January uh, 2020 to May 2021. So it just came down in May. So the interruption was not with the piece itself, but with anyone being inside the pavilion to experience the sound. Uh, and also, uh, we had wanted to bring um, people together in having discussions about various aspects of, um, of lighting and sound and, um, 
you know, what, what, this, what these large, overly large bodies portend. Also, there was uh, ideas about class. The classics, in terms of, uh, there's a term for classics professors use, but they talk about how to bring the classics, the idea, into contemporary readings. And one of them has to do with, like, the color, the polychrome, statues, and one of the reasons that my pieces were all so very intensely colored was because I was working with that idea of how, you know, everybody, some, some people think that classical sculpture is all white marble, and it really, it has nothing to do with that. So, and also, you know, so there are all these things that we were hoping to do. So the piece itself existed, and it was kept up for longer than it was supposed to be. Yeah, so it wasn't didn't come down until May. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it, uh, I'm trying to think of how to answer that. Yes. It takes a lot of planning, um, like uh, planning in terms of spatial planning and um, digital uh, design, uh, so that I had a digital designer, I worked with someone, and then um, we then worked with the fabricator, but I think we laid it out, but then the fabricator, of course, has to deal with the issues like the, the baffles inside, you know, and all of that, the interior construction, so I want this piece that has this particular shape, and then, you know, so that's a visual thing, and then, you know, and then we had to work out all the, uh, you know, like the technical things about, each one has a big blower in the top of the piece, it's, a, you know, it's where the braid comes out of the top, so all of those, um, all of those concerns have to be worked out uh, with the fabricator and the designer and myself. No, they, they, I think they, they, they make a lot of pieces that are like um, big Coke bottles, I guess, you know, like they, they do advertising inflatables. Um, and I don't think this place, which is in, it's called Landmark Creations, and it's in, um, uh, it, it's in uh, Minnesota, and I've worked with them since the um, 2002 uh, a double exposure piece. They they fabricated that piece for me. And then they fabricated the um, the cowgirls, and then they fabricated this this piece. So um, I've I've worked with them, and um, and they fabricate big production pieces for um, uh, like MTV and things like that. Yeah. So they they do a lot of different things. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, again. Thank you. You've been a wonderful audience, and I really appreciate being here in person. I really love that. Thank you.